Native content campaigns that rock. Uh, we have Jared Dicker, head of commercial product and operations at Rebel Mouse, who's sponsor, uh, powering the social engagement for our event. Tessa Gold, the Huffington Post Media Group's director of native advertising. Adam Ostrow, the chief strategy officer at Mashable. And this is going to be moderated by Avi Savar, the chairman and founder of Big Fuel, making his return to the Westchester Digital Summit. So let's give him a big warm welcome. So I'm Avi Svar, uh, founder and uh, chairman of Big Fuel. We're a social media agency uh, based in New York City. Um, I'm going to let my esteemed panel introduce themselves very briefly, and then we'll get right into it. Take it away, Jared. Hey, everyone. I'm Jared Dicker. I'm the head of product at a company called Rebel Mouse. Um, we started as an aggregation and curation social technology, and uh, I'll get to it later uh, in the panel, but we've really grown a lot in terms of helping uh, small businesses to large publishers and brands uh, really bring all their assets together and make actionable decisions in terms of distributing that, um, all that information, so. Hi, everyone. I'm Tessa Gold. I'm the director of Native Advertising at um, a little publication called The Huffington Post. Just a little one. Just a small little one. Um, so I um, run both the Native Advertising um, division in terms of like it being a monetization strategy for the Huffington Post. Uh, and part of that is we have an in-house studio called HuffPost Partner Studio that I oversee. So that's a dedicated team of like writers, copy editors, designers, social media strategists that sit on the business side um, of the Huffington Post and they create content for brands that live on our platform. And I'm Adam Ostro, I'm Chief Strategy Officer at Mashable. We're a digital media company uh, founded in 2005. I've been there since 2007, uh, grew up on the editorial side, was our editor-in-chief for four years, then moved over to uh, business and strategy uh, about three years ago, yeah. <laughs> uh, part of which entails running our branded content team, which develops creative solutions for brands on the site. Cool. Um, so let's kind of jump right into it. I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll level set for a second and, and um, kind of introduce the idea of native advertising and, and what it is. For, for the folks here and, and why it's important, and then you know dive right into you know some of the key challenges, kind of where the world is going as it relates to branded content, and you know the idea being the the need and importance of native advertising today more so than I think ever. Native advertising has been around for a very long time. You know it, it's it's not a new concept by any means. I think we've just labeled it something new, um, and it's taken a, a, a center stage, if you will based on the fact that the way consumers are, are ingesting media has changed dramatically. And, and for the longest time, um, publishers have had a kind of walled garden approach to their content um, based specifically around the idea that their monetization strategies were driven by display advertising. So the idea is I'm going to amass a large audience. I'm going to bring those people to my site. Um, where they're going to read, ingest, consume my content, and I'm going to serve up ads uh, alongside that content in order to generate revenue. Um, sadly, or not so sadly, just the reality of where the world is, um, most people don't consume content that way anymore. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but for the most part, uh, everything has really moved into kind of the delivery of content through a feed of some sort whether it's on your mobile phone, whether it's through a Facebook feed, a Twitter feed, um, whatever it might be, maybe it's shared via email, e whatever it might be, the way content is coming into our lives has changed dramatically. And that posed a, a, a pretty significant problem for publishers um, who were uh, making their money through a, a, a traditional display model. And so now Native has come into uh, the, the limelight as a way for publishers to kind of um, monetize the feed. And I think that's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Um, and let's kind of dive into it. You know, Adam, you've, you've been with Mashable for a long time. You've seen a lot of the migration that I just kind of alluded to. Uh, you guys have always been ahead of the curve for, for the most part. And, and so give me a little bit of, of kind of that background in terms of how you've seen the migration happen and how you are now um, 
advising your brand partners uh, as it relates to um, branded content? What strategies are you implementing? Kind of give me your state of the union. Sure. So, like you said, I mean, branded content's been around a long time. If you go back to the Guinness Book of World Records, that was actually created exactly. by the Guinness Brewing Company. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, in Immashable, it's been part of our business model since very early on, um, since, since near the time that I started. And our view, um, because we consider ourselves both a, a media company but also a product and technology company, has always been to create an offering that's both good for readers and good for advertisers. Mm -hmm. So it started out very much with that notion in, in kind of the 2007, 2008 time frame when Mashable was, I would say, much more of a vertically focused technology and social media site than, than we are today. Um, but what that entailed was creating content. So American Express, for instance, is one of our first big advertisers. And they were on a site called openforum.com, which some of you guys might be familiar with. And what we did with American Express is essentially create content that lived both on Mashable and on Amex, um, basically talking about how small businesses can utilize social media. So content that's very relevant to our readers, but also very relevant to the audience that American Express is trying to reach. Now, how that's evolved over the last few years, building off some of what you said, we've seen Mashable's audience move to uh, being more than 50% of our readers consuming content on their mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what uh, people are doing primarily on their mobile devices, it's accessing social networking sites, places like Twitter and Facebook, living in the feed, so to speak. So um, for us, it's become incredibly important both for our content to find out or figure out ways to, to really connect with the audience in the feed. So Mashable's always been very aggressive in our use of social as a distribution platform. So we're one of the largest media brands on Twitter on Facebook, but also emerging platforms like Vine and Instagram and, and Pinterest. And what we've done on the branded side is we launched a redesign on our site uh, about a year and a half ago at this point, where we essentially take those branded content programs that we're doing and move them into the feed on Mashable. So we now have a responsive design, which means essentially we optimize the experience on Mashable for the device that you're on. and in the feed when you're scrolling through stories, you might see one of those articles or videos or infographics that's presented by American Express show up in the feed of content, photo, headline, just like any other Mashable story, clearly disclosed as being a piece of branded content, um, but really making it a, a, an experience that's native to the site. Um, but it starts with good content, creating something that our readers are genuinely interested in and want to consume and ultimately share with their friends. Right, so you know, as we kind of move into this new world order, you know, consumers, essentially the, the difference between advertising and content is going to become indistinguishable. Where are, you, um, where are you seeing this content coming from? Are you creating most of it? Are brands coming to you with content that they already have? Um, what is, you know, Tessa was talking about a, a studio that they have built specifically to create. What are, what are, what are you seeing in that area? It's a bit of both. So we have a, both a branded content team and a creative services team in-house that helps develop these programs. So. Um, you know, essentially the process is often brand comes to us is looking to reach a, a certain demographic, certain type of audience with a certain type of theme. And we, we really think about our uh, branded content group as helping brands tell stories about more than just their products. So Capital One's another good example of that. They have also been an advertiser on the small business side of things. Um, and March Madness is kind of one of their pivotal events every year. So we actually created something called uh, America's most social small business, where we basically had small businesses tell us about their social media strategy and created a bracket style competition um, between them uh, during March. Uh, Capital One now, and actually this is the only plug I'll make, we're actually um, doing a casting call for small businesses launching in the next few months cool. uh, and doing I'm a sure there are a number of them here. <laughs> and uh, doing a docu documentary video series uh, on that. So, um, but then there are brands that are much further along and are already creating great branded content. I know there was someone here from, from GE this morning. Yeah. Um, GE did a great program called Six Second Science earlier this year. I think it was actually last year at this point. Um, but basically where they encourage their community to create vines, uh, science experiments using Vine, which is the six second video mm -hmm. platform. And that was a great series, something we thought our audience would enjoy and want to participate in. So essentially all we did at Mashable was take that content and amplify it. Uh, in our stream, so put it on a Mashable article page that's bylined by GE and lifted it through those native ad units I talked about. Mm -hmm. Cool. So just kind of move, moving down the line, Tessa, talk, talk to me. You guys have been in the, the branded content native advertising business for a long time. 
right? Um, and where where is this all going? I mean, what where where's kind of the evolution of it? Is 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 native going to kill display? Uh, is display always going to be around? Um, is it a blend of both? What are you thinking about in terms of where where uh, where we go from here? Sure. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, like, where is it going? So we, we, the Huffington Post has been doing native advertising since 2010. It's just back in 2010, we didn't call it native advertising. Right. So um, it isn't really anything new. It's really just the evolution of like content for brands in stream in a digital platform. That's, that's really the evolution of it. Um, Interestingly though, even though we've been doing it since 2010, I'd say like at any given time, uh, and this is still the case today, roughly 70% of our customers I think are first time native clients. So there are still a lot of brands out there that aren't doing a lot with content um, and are still looking you know, like to experiment with this format. Um, which is exciting and I think presents a huge opportunity to a lot of you out there if you have a small to medium sized enterprise and you're looking to like, you know, uh, align your brand with thematically relevant content in stream um, on a publicational platform that your, you know, intended consumers go to. Um, but we're really excited. We think there's still a lot of growth to come. I think for Q1 this year, just illustrated, um, Q1 revenue for native advertising at Huffington Post was 400% higher than Q1 last year. So we're seeing huge growth. Um, but I think there is still a lot of room to go and a lot of room for improvement in the industry. I think as a whole, um, the, the quality generally needs to come up. Um, and that will come as people, you know, realize the difference between traditional editorial versus, um, you know, native advertising or native content that actually needs to sort of provide the reader with some inherent value versus, you know, blatantly being a forum to, you know, promote your product um, or service offering. And then I think at the moment as well, um, there's a lot of great ad technology out there that hasn't yet been applied um, in, a, in a mass way to native advertising to date. A lot of um, publications and platforms and brands are, you know, are still doing this very manually through their content management system. Um, but one great way to drive a lot greater scale um, and to push consumers further through the consideration funnel um, is ad tech, right? We think of native advertising as being sort of like upper to mid funnel. But if you want to potentially like drive conversions and get people to sign up, you know, as a consumer on your website, you can actually, if they viewed your native content or your sponsored story on the Huffington Post or on Mashable, you could retarget those people who viewed them maybe later on Facebook with your display ads. And that is a very, very effective strategy for driving conversions. And not many people are really doing that yet. But I think, I think that's where we'll see things go. So are, are brands coming to you with um, existing campaigns that they need your help with to integrate? Are they coming to you and just saying, we don't know what to do, help us? What, tell us, like, how, all how are you? Above. Right, all okay. of the above. I mean, it, it varies. Everything from um, a great example was, uh, some of you may remember, towards the end of the, last year, the CEO of Barilla, the pasta company, made some quite unsavory <laughs> remarks uh, in the press. And so them through their PR agency Edelman actually approached us and they wanted to do some content to help better position the brand as not being so, um, how should I say, like stuffy. Um, <laughs> so we actually work with them on a series of three brand blogs and we help them find, uh, find some relevant bloggers to um, blog about issues that are relevant, thematically relevant to their brand. So there was actually um, a blogger we found who um, shared an experience about her communicating to her family or her, to her children that she was a lesbian over dinner, right? And, you know, it's not about pasta, but it was like, you know, the Barilla ads surrounded the content uh, and the piece did really well. Like that individual blog was shared almost 5,000 times on Facebook. Um, so, you know, that's an opportunity where we're like trying to help um, people, I guess, like reposition themselves or revive their brand. Uh, or we might be helping, you know, a brand, uh, a, uh, maybe like a theatrical brand or a TV series, 
drive um, increased awareness before you know the launch of a movie or a, um, a TV series going mm -hmm. live. So really across the board. Right. Good. Uh, so Jared, uh, you play a little bit of a different role on, on the panel, right? You're not a, a publisher per se, but more of a platform company. Um, and correct me if I botch this, but right, you guys kind of play uh, uh, on, on kind of bookending the process, right? You're not so much about the delivery of the asset, but really identifying key opportunities on the front end as it relates to what content is surfacing up, bubbling up that I can pull out of um, the community or out of the feed and amplify through paid media. And then also giving brands a place to drop people off, right? So give me, give me a little bit of that kind of loop um, and, and how you guys are thinking about um, advising your clients, your brand uh, partners. Yeah, great. So um, uh, yeah, that's very accurate. Um, mm -hmm. So the core technology of Huffington, or Huffington Post, geez. the core <laughs> technology of Rebel Mouse um, comes from what we did at the Huffington Post. So our core technology team was from Huffington Post. And what we saw there and what Tessa kind of highlights is the ability to understand what content's gonna resonate best with an audience and fuel them with that, and then allow them to share it and recognize them and so on. And we noticed that there's a lot of publishers and small businesses and brands that wanna take advantage of those things, but they don't know how and they don't have the staff and uh, they don't have people to create amazing content or um, bloggers to come on the site. So what we started to think about is what's the way where we could tie in um, to the different social networks, to different feeds as you know is a big theme here, um, and be able to scrape that material to be able to find content, discover content, and then create content based on what you know is working best. So what we've done um, from a very large scale, so uh, as Avi mentioned, um, we kind of run the gamut in terms of what we could do for small businesses and also what we do for GE and Mondelez um, and Time Inc. So uh, what our technology basically does, um, to make it very simple, is scrape different feeds and scrape different RSSs to pull through content based on a query. So uh, if there's an interest in a hashtag, if you're a car dealer and you wanna know who's trying to find an automobile in X area, um, we're connected to Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, any feed, any API that you wanna to connect to our system that could then query um, all these different platforms that bring in the content that's most important to you. Um, what's great, and what our partnership, uh, a very deep partnership with Twitter shows, is that the way that we can filter and pull in this content on a very micro level has been so beneficial in finding that content that you really want to surface and then display. Um, so whether it's to create a website, which uh, we really pride ourselves in allowing the consumer to do that in 10 minutes just by setting up their feeds or pulling in the content they want and then being able to display it the way we scrape it in, a, in an instance, or it's pulling in different creative that ad companies want to use around a certain subject and then distribute it through in a live, very real-time setting. Um, we're, we're opening that technology to all different consumers to really see who it benefits most, who's taking most advantage of it, and we're really allowing all that, um, all that owned media that everyone's creating and maybe not creating, but that's out there for them to take and leverage and use uh, for their own benefit and awareness and campaigns. Cool. So, so let's let's talk for a second about you know kind of um, simple strategies that the folks here can um, can leverage. You know, if I'm a brand, uh, small, medium-sized business, and I don't have the big bucks to advertise on AOL, or you know, maybe I'm working towards that goal. Um, what are some things that you know that I can do today, tomorrow, next week to start thinking about my content strategy, to start thinking about amplifying content externally? You know, and um, let's start kind of Adam. Like, give, give me, give me, give me some advice. Yeah, I mean, like you know, some of the businesses we we profile in that series I just talked about. I mean, certainly would encourage people to check it out in terms of our uh, small business challenge. I mean, they're not businesses. Yeah, they can go spend tens of thousands of dollars right. on a branded content campaign. Um, but what they can do, which is uh, really one of the great things that's starting to develop with social, is targeting. Right. So if you're kind of a business that. Um, is only serving folks in a particular region, what you can do is create content. And we actually do this at Mashable. If you create content that's particularly relevant to a certain geography, being able to target that, mm -hmm. put a little bit of paid media behind it. Because one of the things that's so important to remember is, um, certainly on Facebook, but, but you're starting to see this on other platforms as well, is even if your business has tens of thousands of followers, you're not necessarily reaching all of them with each update. In fact, you're probably only reaching about 10% of them, I think is around where the number falls right now on average. So it's really important to 
develop content that people are going to want to share. Um, on Facebook, the concept is, is called edge rank, essentially, where Facebook's algorithm is, is deciding what to show to people based on the level of engagement with that content. So it's really important that you create content that's engaging, that people are going to want to share. And you know, at a tactical thing, some of the things that we've seen work particularly well with our updates are having really strong visuals, um, also having really engaging prompts and, and, and headlines. Um, you do need to be active with it, because I think um, you know, one thing you, you often see is feeds can be just nothing but promotions or headlines and links. Um, so it's really important to create, I think, engaging content, visual content, stuff that people are going to want to share and like um, on these social platforms. Okay. So, and, and once I create it, right? So I've, I'm, a, I'm a law firm. I create a piece of content that I think is relevant to my core customer and M&A or real estate or whatever it might be. What do I do with it? Uh, so I now have this asset. What, what's, what's, what's next? Where am I going? How am I distributing? How am I thinking about getting it into the hands of people that I want to see? You know, give me a... Well, I mean, it really depends on what, what, whether you have any money, right? <laughs> um, so if you have money, then obviously there's like paid distribution strategies you could be using. You could, um, I mean, depending on the content and what you're doing, you could, you know, promote it on LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, you could be working with a, you know, a particular publisher. You know, we, we do sponsored brand blogs. So if you're a brand and you want to actually pay for some content or a blog that you've written to appear on the Huffington Post, you can do that. Um, or you could pay us to create something for you. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of options. Um, I think one of the tough things for brands is that um, people may already do this stuff, but people don't do, or brands aren't really doing a good job of like, measuring the success of their um, their individual efforts and then like taking those insights from each effort um, and using them you know towards an you know applying them towards the next campaign I think people are trying to do a lot and spread themselves really thin when they should be focusing on doing like less pieces and being a little bit more careful about um, you know what they do what they say and where they distribute them right. so and Jared so uh, in, in addition to creating content, I can also curate content. So let's talk a little bit about a curation strategy, right? So I may not need to create a, a white paper or a video or something. Um, there's a ton of stuff out there that already exists. How do I, how do I leverage that to benefit me? Yeah, totally. So I think what's great, and um, especially what our technology is looking to do, is that you're able to go out and find the content that's most relevant to you and also have tools in the back end, in, in the back end that then engage that audience to get them to come back. So what we basically do, um, if you're a small business or a type of company and you want to see what the conversation is around certain content, um, whether it's a Facebook platform, a Twitter platform, or content that's just uh, in search and on the web, to be able to pull that in, but then also have the technology to then send an app mention automatically or send an email alert or an Instagram shout out that says, hey, check it out, you're featured on myblog.com or my website about X. And then they go there, they're like, oh my God, this is a business in my community, I didn't know about them, they're featuring me. You kind of build this relationship in a very automated way where it's very difficult, especially with the small business and the staffing and uh, to be able to understand, oh, I have a Twitter person, I have a Facebook person, I have people that are gonna um, do email and outreach and stuff like that. So what we're looking to do is really make that technology easy. And also on the buying side, as Tessa said, it always works well when you have a lot of money to spend and take that information that you have and boost it. Um, but what we also look to do on our back end is pulling in that content, seeing what's working best, being able to recognize the audience, and then also being piped into Twitter, Facebook buying, so that if there's a post that's doing really well, or it's about to go viral, or it's going to be great for your business and there's great chatter about it, to be able to just press a button and then push it onto Facebook, or push it onto Twitter with a small buy and see how it performs. You know, we we not only are monitoring how that content's performing on your .com or your mobile site or your app, but also how that content's performing on its native channel as well. So there could be a lot of chatter. There could be an influencer that says something amazing about your business with 5,000 Twitter followers that you never knew about. That now you're then able to go out, 
say thank you so much, recognize this, and now you have somebody that has a strong affinity with your brand that's influential on social without having to pay yeah. any money. That, right? That's something we do aggressively too. When you see a piece of content starting to, to take off or showing signs of potentially being something viral is making sure we amplify that on our most valuable channels, sometimes putting paid media behind it as well. Because what we found is if you have content that's a dud, there's no <laughs> amount of money that can yeah, save it. True. It's going to save that's it. Right. Uh, so, it's, so it's very fo f very important, I think, to focus on the winners and kind of cut the losers as soon as you can. Yeah, we, we I couldn't agree more. We it's part of a, a big part of our strategy, uh, you know, before we even recommend paid media is to, you know, back the winning horse, right? So you put two, three pieces of content in market, see how people are reacting, and. You know, there's a term thrown around. I'm not sure if it actually m means what it is, but you know, it's the viral coefficient of the content that you're distributing. So the idea is you put a piece of content, three pieces of content in the marketplace. One piece of content is not getting shared at all. One piece of content for every 10 people that see it is getting shared once. The last piece of content for every 10 users is getting shared four times. So you want to back that with paid in order to benefit from the uptick on the earned um, and so is that something that you guys uh, are, are looking at on a regular basis as you advise your, your, your clients? Um, you know, how are you thinking about that as it relates to you know, the development of content? Are you creating multiple pieces of uh, multiple assets uh, for every yeah, campaign? Well, we've actually, uh, you know, we've built technology to try to solve that problem. So we built our own predictive analytics platform that we call Velocity that does a number of things on the you know editorial side of the company it's monitoring the web and seeing kind of the stories that have viral potential which informs our editorial team these are things you might want to consider covering and then on the distribution side it helps determine how our home page is organized and uh, also on our social side um, what I was just talking about in terms of which stories that Mashable has published should we be sharing should we potentially be putting some paid media behind um, and we're also looking to do uh, some of that, tying that back to our branded content campaign. So instead of being in a very, um, I would say, dated model where you're just buying a set number of impressions, moving it to where a client you know, has a piece of branded content that's really taking off, why not back that further? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think they say one in nine pieces of content has the potential to go viral, right? So if you're thinking about um, a, you know, like a content strategy, you know, everyone, everyone wants a viral hit and we get asked all the time, like, can you create one piece of content for us around this? And like, they're hoping that that's gonna go viral and that's really just putting all your eggs in one basket. So we always recommend like an ideal number of pieces of content for your c campaign, depending on the length of time that we're talking about, but would be anywhere between four and nine pieces. And, you know, we don't recommend putting paid dollars, additional paid dollars into promoting those pieces beyond us unless you're doing more than four pieces because to Adam's point, like anything less than that, you could be like just putting dead dollars behind backing a, you know, a horse with a broken leg. Yeah, so it's four to nine pieces over what time frame? Uh, so we would say like four to nine pieces per, typically over like four to eight weeks. Got it, mm -hmm. got it, okay, cool. So it, it, just, I'm gonna shift gears quickly. We have, you know, two, two minutes left. You know, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a small publisher, today, small, you know, blog or, or, or news, local newspaper, um, and I'm, you know, kind of rooted in my way of doing business, what, what, what should I be thinking about in terms of adopting some strategies to, to help local businesses? Because, right, I mean, local happens in, in radio, it happens in print, it, it, and always kind of the last to, to follow. So how, how should we be thinking about advising kind of local media properties uh, to get on the bandwagon. What do you guys think about that? Anybody? Oh, um, all right, so I'll go quickly. Um, yeah. I think uh, what we're seeing now with what people are paying for social agencies and what they're doing with their creative agencies with this divide with banner media and social media, where there's such a love and affinity um, for all the KPIs that you're getting on social, the likes, the, the uh, favorites, the retweets, where um, there's a core value to uh, what, what each brand and small publisher uh, kind of takes for granted there, where on the banner media side, the clicks, and we're still seeing issues there that, that are problematic, especially with the small publisher. And what we're trying to bridge and where we're seeing a lot of success is taking that social content, you know, the Twitter content, the Facebook content that's doing really well for brands and advertisers, and being able to put it quickly into 
a 300 by 250 or standard ad unit on your publishing site or in the well where it doesn't take a lot of effort, it doesn't take a creative agency to do, it's content they're already creating, but then it allows the small publishers to be able to monetize based on what these other brands are doing on social, be able to plug it in, and it doesn't have to get real deep in terms of preparation and creative assets and stuff like that. It's taking what they already do well and just putting it towards the right audience on your publisher side. Yeah, I would say another thing for local publishers, local media to think about are things like this, events. I mean, I think um, it's something that we do at Mashable as part of our business is create events which are generally local in nature. We actually just hosted a hackathon up in Boston that was sponsored by Emirates, the airline, because they were launching a new uh, Boston to Dubai route. Um, but if you think about events, they're offline, but they can also be online, right? You guys are sharing what we're saying up here on the stage, on, on Twitter and Facebook. There's probably going to be some blog posts created out of it. So events are a great way to, I think, bring your audience together, but then also create content, um, both yourself and then the audience will create content for you when they attend. So uh, I think events are a smart strategy for local publishers to look at. Um, I would say that you also don't have to be, even though you might be a local publication, you don't actually have to be confined to just working with local advertisers and, and trying to monetize the long tail. There are actually some really great ad tech um, companies that are emerging in this space that are helping um, you know, smaller publishers have native avid strategies. You know, it's not the strategy that we adopt at the Huffington Post or that you guys use at Mashable, but there are companies out there like Sharethrough, Taboola, Outbrain, um, uh, what's another one, Nativo, and they'll all allow you to like backfill um, space on your, like remnant space on your site with branded assets from big national advertisers who are trying to reach your audience. So that can be a really great way to monetize your site without having to invest a lot of dollars in chasing the long tail or investing in an in-house content studio. Awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. Very, very uh, um, good information and good content. Um, some of it native, some of it not. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks.